Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world and inspiring future creators and for all those that like really great stories. I'm Ira Pastor. I'm your aging and longevity ambassador along for this journey. And for the last several shows, we've been spending a lot of time at the different hierarchical levels of the biologic processes behind life and aging. Uh, we've talked about the genome, the microbiome, extracellular matrices. Uh, spend a little time at the hydrodynamic basis of life. However, you know, we can't forget that while all these integrated and varied biologic processes are important in the daily maintenance of our health and wellness, uh, that when things go wrong, uh, the trickle down is unfortunately a wide range of chronic degenerative diseases that are responsible for human suffering, death, and in 2019, a, a $7 trillion global healthcare expenditure. And one of the major groups of pathologies uh, responsible for a major part of that figure remains diabetes, um, a group of metabolic and endocrinologic uh, pathologies that affect over 350 million people around the world, uh, projected to surpass 500 million in the coming decades. And the current global estimated cost of diabetes, both medical and reduced productivity, is estimated somewhere around three quarters of a trillion dollars per year. So it is a major unmet medical need for us still. Type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes, is a, is a form where there's very little insulin produced by the pancreas. And while it causes unknown. It's believed to be a combination of genetic and environmental factors uh, and mechanisms involving the destruction, autoimmune-wise, of the pancreas and the beta cells. While type 2 diabetes involves insulin resistance and the condition in which cells, cells fail to produce uh, and respond to insulin properly. Uh, complications involving retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, cardiovascular disease, all major causes of morbidity and mortality, as well as uh, severe hypoglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. And you know, in addition to diet and lifestyle changes uh, and oral hypoglycemic agents, which are primarily reserved for type 2 diabetes, you know, the core pharmacotherapeutic interventions uh, still in 2019 remain replacement of insulin, first developed over 100 years ago, 1922, as well as some translational work in the area of immunosuppression as far as early prevention of the disease. Today's guest, who I'm very excited about, who is going to take us further along this theme and sort of where the future is taking us in the diabetes space and related comorbidities is Dr. Camilo Ricordi, who is Director and Chief Academic Officer of the Diabetes Research Institute at the University of Miami, the Director of DRI Cell Transplant Center and Professor of Surgery and Stacy Joy Goodman, Distinguished Professor of Medicine, Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Miami. Dr. Cordy, uh, after graduating with a degree in medicine at San Rafael Institute in Milan, specialized in gastrointestinal surgery and digestive endoscopy at the University of Milan, it was during this period of time that he conducted really groundbreaking work, not only trading in immunogenetics and immunobiology of cell transplantation, but he was part of a team in 1986 at Washington University in St. Louis the pioneer really a cutting edge isolate cell transplant procedure is credited with developing the automated method for isolate cell isolation known as the recording method and the use of the recording chamber which was a machine that enhanced the ability to disassemble pancreatic tissues via a combination of enzymatic and mechanical digestion techniques while preserving endocrine cell cluster integrity and this method has become the gold standard for pancreas processing it's contributed to the success of a number uh, of clinical trials involving isolate cell transplantation worldwide. And it's really made it possible to obtain a much greater amount of isolate cells, both from either human or animal pancreases. Following all of that, Dr. Cordy had a period of military service in the Italian Air Force. He worked as a medical officer, with the rank of lieutenant, and after that joined as assistant professor of surgery in the Department of Surgery and Division of Transplantation at the School of Medicine at University of Pittsburgh, and then joined the University of Miami in the early 1990s, where he has served in numerous roles, including co-director of the Executive Office of Research Leadership, Senior Associate Dean of Research, and Chair of the Dean's Research Office. In 2015, Dr. Cordy was involved in leading a University of Miami team that was involved in performing the first successful transplant of a bioengineered engineered pancreas implanted with a 3D bioactive resorbable scaffold, uh, which was done in the abdominal cavity of a recipient with a severe form of type 1 diabetes. Uh, and Dr. Cordy has been more than extensively published in academic and medical journals, uh, authored over a thousand scientific publications, been cited over 42,000 times, uh, is currently uh, serves on the editorial board of Cell R4 as editor in chief, and has been awarded numerous patents as an inventor, uh, and continues to lead and participate in the area 
of isolation and transplantation of islet cells for diabetes, as well as sort of the continual research interest in areas of innovative strategies for cell transplantation and organ transplantation, uh, looking at ways that we can achieve these you know, basic outcomes without the need for the large amount of anti-rejection drugs. And he's also involved in reversal of autoimmune disease, development of anti-inflammatory and regenerative medicine strategies uh, to prevent and treat chronic degenerative diseases and to ultimately prolong healthy lifespan and health span. Wow, uh, all that being said, we could go on for a whole show, but Dr. Accordi, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today on the show. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for this uh, very comprehensive introduction. I, I couldn't have done it better. Thank you for that. Didn't want, didn't want you have to give a lecture on diabetes <laughs> to start the show. But um, you know, basically, I wanted to jump off. We typically you know, give the floor to our guest at the beginning, really just to learn a little bit more about you, sort of you know, how you started this journey, you know, where you grew up, how you got interested in science, ultimately how you got interested in medicine, and sort of what led you to pursue this interest in metabolism, endocrinology, uh, as opposed to other areas of of scientific pursuit? Well, so I was born in New York, as you can tell from my accent, and uh, <laughs> I was 57, and my father and my family has been in the music business for 200 years, and I've been the black sheep that took medicine instead, <laughs> the first one to betray. But um, uh, my family has been developing, like recording, publishing, and uh, music all the operas that you know from Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, Verdi, mm -hmm. so my, my father was in New York uh, for a joint venture with Mercury Records. Then we moved back to Italy <coughs> when he produced the first record with Maria Callas and then the, the record division of the industry. And so it was a little shock when I chose to take medicine uh, when I graduated from high school. But... Uh, that has been my passion, it was always more towards science. Before it was astrophysics and then brain research. I started medicine to do uh, neuroscience. And um, after reading a book from John Eccles, Understanding of the Brain was a Nobel Prize back then uh, in medicine. And so I did, um, I took, I started medical school to do neuroscience. And then I switched to highly transplantation and diabetes after I graduated because my little cousin was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So I said, well, I, I'll spend a couple of years to cure diabetes and then I'll move back to neuroscience. <laughs> that was like 1984 or so. And, uh, and I, I rapidly, uh, immediately after the military service uh, in 84, I realized that uh, I, I couldn't do what I, my idea on processing the pancreas in Milan, we didn't have the infrastructure or the resources to test the system and I was lucky enough to be accepted at Washington University in St. Louis where there was the pioneer in the field and Paul, Paul Lacey who was chair of uh, the Department of Pathology and who allowed me to to spend a year I got this uh, award this NIH training award <laughs> and uh, and I had a, a minimal salary to be able to explore my ideas but for the first year I couldn't do it um, when I proposed this idea of putting the pancreas in a chamber, disassembling progressively and having islets on the other side, everybody was laughing, saying it's impossible. How can you take a piece of uh, meat, if you wish, and then uh, separate microscopic structures that are in the hundreds of thousands and separate them intact in another compartment? Uh, so I couldn't do it for the first year. I had to work on the traditional method that was more meat grinder base, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also called tissue macerator. But then I was lucky enough that the Friday evening there was a human pancreas that arrived in the lab that uh, was judged too old or too marginal to spend the money to do the procedures, to stay up a Friday night with the whole team. So everybody left and the pancreas was thrown in the trash can, meaning the biological bean for trash. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I waited for everybody to leave. I said, I have to catch up with some work on the computer. And then when everybody was gone, I picked it up from the trash. And I said, I'll try my hypothesis. And if it doesn't work, I will not tell anyone on Saturday morning. <laughs> if it works, I'll tell my boss for less. So then I, I was lucky enough that it worked. Uh, so 
well that when Olesi came the next morning and looked at the silence at the microscope, started calling people, come here immediately, come here, and uh, collaborators from surgery here and there. And so at that point, I knew that we were on something uh, relatively big. At that time, they were working with McDonnell Douglas Corporation engineers on this other patent uh, for another processing. So we started comparing the two procedures for two weeks, and after two weeks, everybody was sent back to their McDonnell Douglas Corporation uh, job, and uh, it was sure switched completely to my uh, system or idea. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is all in the publication, the books we went from the first successful series of clinical trials at the University of Pittsburgh with Thomas Tartzel at the Transplant Institute there where I worked for three and a half years directly in the cell transplant section of the institute to, uh, and that was actually a curious instance because I went back from Washington University, I went back one year in Milan to say I'm bringing back the procedure, we can start the eyelid transplant in Milan San Rafael Institute. But mm -hmm. they didn't believe me. The leadership said, why should you succeed that uh, St. Louis is not succeeding and uh, Miami is not doing it? Nobody, why don't, shouldn't we wait to see if anyone else starts? And I was very upset because it was one year. I come back to Italy, bring the technology, start the processing facility, and, and now I cannot do, nobody can take the courage to test it clinically. So then one day, Dr. Starts from Pittsburgh, I was... At the time I was a surgeon, uh, attending surgeon of the Department of Surgery, I was making rounds and they called me from the nursing station and said, there is a certain Dr. Starzl that would like to talk to you. And you have to understand, if you're a surgeon, Starzl was like a god, like uh, he's like the, mm -hmm. the number one transplant surgeon in the world with the, the number one transplant institute. And he told me... Um, it was so emotional that he told me, but do you speak English to understand? Because I said, yes, yes, I'm just uh, so happy, honored to hear your voice. I only read your books and your papers. And he says, well, I spoke with the chairman of the Nobel Committee in Stockholm, Carl Gustav Groth, uh, to ask him who is the top uh, person for eyelid transplantation to, to start an eyelid transplant program in Pittsburgh. And you happen to be the first name on a list of uh, 10 individuals, but I have no time to waste. So I give you one day to decide, 24 hours to decide, and should you accept this mission, one week to move to Pittsburgh. <laughs> I, said, I took my 24 hours, but I already decided that instant that I was gone from Milan, and that was the last time I, I still collaborate a lot with the Italian Institute and Centers. Mm -hmm. and I, president of a transplant institute that is a joint venture of University of Pittsburgh and Italian government in Italy, but I've been based since then in Pittsburgh and then from Pittsburgh to the University of Miami since 1993. So that in a nutshell how it started and then I left Milan where I had a tenure position in surgery to go to Pittsburgh with a six-month contract as visiting assistant professor, which was like a Everybody told me you're crazy, you're leaving tenure position for life in Milan. You're in the round table of the surgeon in Milan, private practice and all the pro prospects for the future for a six month opportunity to test your crazy idea in Pittsburgh. And, um, but so it was. And, uh, and then <coughs> uh, when we did publish in the Lancet the first successful trial of eyelid transplantation. Then it was like a University of Miami started asking me, Harvard, Los Angeles, and at the time uh, I chose Miami because it was the only institute fully dedicated to curing taekwondo diabetes with sort of an affiliation agreement with the university, so that there is no dean or no one that could take that space and redirect it to something else that is more fashionable, like a fashionable like gene therapy, nanotechnology, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was an advantage to have the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation completely committed to support your sure. efforts and letting you also collaborate worldwide to synergize efforts uh, with the rest of the world. So we have now a Diabetes Research Institute Federation with over 20 centers worldwide, from Stanford to China, from uh, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm to Edmonton in Canada, and many other in Europe and in Italy. Mm -hmm. so it's been really uh, 
the ability to do in a way what you want to synergize efforts worldwide on the path to a cure for type 1 diabetes. Incidentally, you mentioned that the majority is type 2 diabetes. It's over, over 430 million now projected to be over 600 million in the next two decades. But the, what is not appreciated is that autoimmunity, of which if you, <laughs> if you sure. wish, type 1 diabetes is a prototype of autoimmune disease condition. But autoimmune disease condition, there are over a hundred autoimmune diseases that affect 20% of the population, as the estimate is, uh, and which means it's twice as big as mm. the, as a whole as a problem. So if you consider a joining forces to to fight and reverse autoimmunity, is something that I'm very happy today just receive a RFA request for proposal where you see diabetes and uh, lupus and uh, multiple sclerosis foundation pulling efforts together because it should be a synergistic effort with other autoimmune disease uh, efforts around the world. So I'm so happy that uh, they listened to me and that uh, this is hopefully what we can develop in the years to come. Yeah, I, have, I actually have a question about autoimmune diseases a little later on, but I'm glad you brought that up because it is an underappreciated uh, sort of basket of pathologies that when you look, when you look at the sheer number, it's, it's quite staggering. You pioneer the recorded method. Uh, it has major impact in the space, uh, becomes the gold standard. Um, and yet now, you know, moving forward, you know, you have, I've, I've read several of your, you know, overviews of sort of what's next. Uh, and, you know, you have this uh, wonderful paper, you know, one of the ones I have here, uh, it's a you know, 2012 Future Medicine, where you talk about from cellular therapies to tissue reprogram and regenerative strategies in the treatment of diabetes. And you basically start off when you refer to, you know, your work in isolate transplantation as the first step. Uh, setting the stage for everything else that's now coming in the, the regenerative medicine area, you really highlight uh, three baskets of possibilities, with, you know, sort of synergistic things. Uh, you talk about activity in sort of embryonic stem cell, uh, pluripotent cell uh, research to ultimately answer the question of how we can create the exceptionally large amounts of, of cells to, to treat millions of patients. Uh, you talk about the multipotent area, the mesenchymal stem cells, as sort of the uh, sort of a microenvironment of the pancreas, not that they're purely regenerative, but ways to help with pluripotent cells in the regeneration process. And then the last part of the paper, you talk about uh, lateral uh, reprogramming, sort of trans differentiation. You have this pancreas, which is 95% you know, of it is not endocrine, it's exocrine, and there's lots of cells there that you could potentially, you know, using some of these newer technologies, uh, start acting like beta isolate cells and so forth. Um, could you just, you know, walk through some of these, you know, these areas, you know, what you're most excited about, you know, which, you know, you're prioritizing at Miami now, because, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating sort of view. Of, okay, okay, you you did the first few decades and you, you, you did groundbreaking stuff and now you sort of planning the, ne the next few decades here. What, what's, what's the most exciting stuff you're doing in this particular, in these three niches? So first uh, it's important to, to mention that we completed the phase three trial with FDA funded by NIH. So now uh, the transplantation is established mm -hmm. as a, even a potentially life-saving situation procedure because uh, it has been shown that improved quality of life on all grounds tested is shown that is improving metabolic control that is preventing severe hypoglycemic episodes but what has not been published yet that we are going to publish very soon is if we look at our uh, the ADA Congress last year we saw data presented on 20 year survival in type 1 diabetes without mm -hmm. immunosuppression just with insulin and the natural history of diabetes is a history of accelerated aging if you want it keeps improving you know the curve keeps shifting to the to the to the right as far as the health span and longevity but uh, you hit the slope at a certain point that now luckily you have perfect uh, look, health span until you're 20, 25, but then uh, between 35 and 45, which is the age range where we're doing islet transplant. Mm -hmm. Diabetes, you start seeing this drop in uh, mortality rate around 20, 28% in the next 20 years. And in islet transplantation, we look at our patients and it's 4% in 20 years. So 96% wow. patient survivors. So potentially the impact of a uh, cell transplant for diabetes, whether it's islets or a stem cell-derived product, 
is huge. And this uh, is why, like the rest of the world, except United States, already accept eyelid transplantation. They reimburse, like in Europe, in Canada, in Australia, right. in England, and um, and there. And the irony is that the nice the entity that review this in-depth review on technology to decide approval or not and reimburse or not in the UK. They approve eyelid transplantation in the UK based on our clinical data from the US. Well, mm. here, the FDA still regulate eyelid transplant like a drug because of right. the interpretation of the rules for many years ago. So we are treated as a pharmaceutical company. The rest of the world is allowing eyelid transplant to be performed like organ transplant. As right, it right. So this is a, a, an irony, a challenge that will be addressed hopefully in the next few months. But... Uh, Eyelid transplantation is established. Now looking at the future, what we call the DRI biohub strategies, looking at these three pillars. One, one is um, engineering the microenvironment, the transplant site to create this mini endocrine organ in the abdominal cavity with uh, physiologic drainage of the secretion to the portal system like the pancreas does. But uh, the other two big pillars is one, how to... Uh, induce tolerance, restore tolerance against autoimmunity, mm -hmm. and uh, avoid uh, uh, immunosuppressive drugs uh, that are generalized immunosuppression, or introduce immunoisolating system or semi-permeable membrane that can physically protect the cells from the attack of the immune system. And then if you will be able to now perform this transplant with either minimal immunosuppression, expanded uh, access or opportunity for patients, and the million of patients, of course, you don't want this to become a lottery and you want uh, an unlimited supply of, of insulin-producing cells. So now in this direction, we are working. Uh, now there are two big areas. One is the xenotransplant, like using animal cells, like from porcine uh, uh, eyelids and we just had a meeting with uh, Dr. Tector that uh, is, has developed uh, this incredible transgenic uh, pigs that have a triple knockout. So they're able to decrease the immunogenicity of these uh, pigs to the one of a human or less. Mm. So now you can transplant cells from a pig that are already used to, to make pork chops and nobody's complaining really about, <laughs> about uh, if you take the pancreas and use it to also cure diabetes, nobody will probably come sure. But it is one possible technology, uh, like making pig tissues and organs uh, um, able to be accepted like human organs. The other big area is, is the one of uh, stem cell derived product, as you mentioned, but also regeneration of insulin producing cells from endocrine precursors that we have in the native pancreas. So on the stem cell front, you see the Big areas are embryonic derived insulin producing cells and new cells. There is a cluster of biotech companies emerging now uh, here and in Europe and Japan uh, and Asia for this uh, purpose. There is one trial already ongoing uh, in clinical pilot trials, and I'm sure there will be, I'm confident there will be at least two other, other clinical trials starting in the next year. And uh, using either embryonic derive insulin producing cells from an embryonic stem cell line or inducible pluripotent stem cell derived that are uh, that is the technology for which uh, Yamanaka and Gordon won the Nobel Prize in 2012 so that mm -hmm. that you can take a self adult cell from your body from uh, any tissue of your body bring it back to become embryonic before you were born and then redifferentiate the cells towards the target cells that you desire, in the case of diabetes, insulin-producing cells. Then I think this has been uh, fascinating because now the question is more uh, commercial, economic, like uh, there are a lot of regulatory issues if you have to do tailor precision medicine patient by patient with his own cells. So everybody's leaning more towards developing cell lines that can be expanded and take care of most of the population sure. without having to take patient by patient, but you can think like banks of uh, stem cell derived insulin producing cells if you have uh, several donor cell lines from blood O, A, B, or a combination of the HLA, you could think uh, like for core blood, you could do. Sure. If this is working, you will see an evolution of this into a huge bank, master cell bank of insulin producing cells, so eventually 
the hospital and clinic will receive the bag ready to be used to in transplant in a, in a patient. The other big area is uh, if you can develop a successful strategy like we're working on now to reverse autoimmunity and restore self tolerance so your body no longer kills insulin producing cells, then you can think about regenerating new insulin producing cells from precursors that are already in the human pancreas. So for decades, nobody looked at this uh, option because in mice that were studies modeled for diabetes, the, the cells are not present in the pancreas, but only in the islets that are destroyed or attacked <coughs> by the autoimmune process. But in the human pancreas, we found uh, a huge amount of uh, precursors, so-called PDX1 positive cells, scattered throughout the ductal system that came with the appropriate molecular signal be triggered to become new insulin producing cells. But the only thing, the only way that this will become successful is if you don't have any more autoimmunity as background, uh, as background system. Otherwise, as a, like Chuck E. Cheese, the, the little puppet that come out and you have to bang with the hammer <laughs> children. If you have new insulin producing cells and the immune system is reactivated to kill them, bang. You never see regeneration. So, but that will be a, a new huge potential once we reset the immune system to no longer kill islets. So you may say that in the future of a transplantation is that there will not be a transplantation anymore. You just regenerate insulin producing cells. But for the time being, islet transplants are already reality in most of the world, hopefully also in the United States soon. And uh, stem cell derived insulin producing cells are next, uh, with potentially sources from uh, porcine insulin producing cells from these transgenic animals. China is doing major effort to select appropriate pigs that can do this job, and they're investing millions in this area also. And it's not just for early transplantation, but you know, you have. A lot of patients dying on the waiting list for organ transplant, so there will be a huge benefit also for kidney transplantation, for example. <laughs> and uh, these are a little the areas that I see as most exciting moving forward. On the molecular level, there is a huge, huge breakthrough that was just uh, brought forward in recent months, that is the anti cd 40 ligand, this uh, co-stimulatory blocking antibody. Okay that uh, is no longer immunosuppression, it's immunomodulation, because it doesn't have the side effect of the traditional immunosuppressive drugs that suppress all the immune system. Right. This antibody is, uh, is working instead only on activated T cells. So uh, activated T cells express uh, CD40 ligand, and the anti-CD40 ligand can go and it's like smart bomb technology only to the cells that are activated in the case of type 1 diabetes. And uh, sure. we're teaming up now with uh, Analixis, that is a, a young biotech company that was able to develop this antibody that was removed by the, from the market uh, two decades ago when it was uh, brought forward by Biogen and IDEC. And at that time, we worked with this antibody and we said, this is the most spectacular thing. We saw in islet transplantation or for transplantation in general, but also for autoimmune disease reversal. But suddenly it was removed from the market and disappeared because there were thromboembolic complications in the kidney transplant setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no way to get this antibody back. <laughs> and then, thanks to the ALS Foundation, this is another autoimmune disease, ALS, they invested millions to fund this uh, venture philanthropy. Uh, model of um, funding and allow this uh, little company <laughs> to generate and engineer an, an anti cd party ligand with a cripple FC receptor that is no longer activating platelets, so no longer has the complication related to uh, thromboembolic events. But there are several other uh, efforts moving in this direction, but uh, we were so enthusiastic that this is already at the clinical level today, and we can move towards uh, doing pilot clinical trials in early transplantation as well. So this to me could be the most uh, amazing breakthrough of the last uh, 20 years in the field, because this could allow the stem cell to be uh, transplanted without immunosuppression, sure. or with a much less immunosuppression, and not just islets, and, and would help uh, the whole field of 
organ tissue and cell transplant to be able to move forward without traditional immunosuppression, as well as allow all these 100 autoimmune disease conditions to potentially benefit from an intervention that is not immunosuppressive, like most of the biologics that are tested today. It's, fa it's fascinating. I, I, I actually remember, I think I remember when that product was, was originally <laughs> taken off the market. That's, that was, but that's... That was uh, devastating for us. Like, yeah. I, I'm not Kenyan, we were like saying, I cannot believe we were Four years is the most spectacular agent we ever tested mm. in the transplant. It galvanized the whole NIH idea to find the transplantation again. Then boom, <coughs> one day with the other was out. So that I'm so glad that the Steve Perrin, actually, that is the CEO of Analysis, was then working at Biogen. So oh, nice he was on the ground. I remember Steve. Uh, and uh, he's now, you should interview, it's an incredible story. You should interview him. It's like a and I have no conflict of interest because I have no stocks. I would invest, but I don't want because I want to be the PI on the clinical trial. <laughs> I have no conflict of interest, but uh, Got it. I Got donated it. some money through the Cure Alliance. But uh, anyway, this is a fascinating story, but can tell you how in our field, one month with the other, you could have a new technology, something new that come out that could be a game changer. So that, yeah. You know, we always have to be careful not to create any hype and uh, or false hope and be, try to move with cautious optimism. But at the same time, there are new developments that make us feel that I mean, it's never been so exciting in the field generally in regenerative medicine and uh, biologic replacement for diabetes. And then now that we, we are also merging, looking at the future with the field of anti-aging because we've been... Uh, working with uh, Scripps and now University of Minnesota Mayo groups that are working on uh, uh, exosome, uh, extracellular vesicle technology and senolytic drugs or senotherapeutics. And, mm -hmm. and is merging with our research on anti-inflammatory modulation of inflammation and things to prevent accelerated aging. Because in a way, the strategies are the same. In Diabetes, we try to prevent accelerated aging and give a regular extended health span or healthy lifespan. And in anti-aging, we try to extend healthy lifespan and compress the period of decline that in the United States has been uh, increasing. Like you have now over 90% uh, of Americans after age 65 have at least one chronic degenerative disease condition and 75% or more have at least two comorbidities. So this uh, <coughs> shows you that we have been pretty good expanding longevity, prolonging uh, lifespan, but not necessarily healthy lifespan. Sure. So then uh, uh, what, you, what you see is like in, in the last three years, for the first time, you see shortening of longevity in the United States. That before, was always increasing. And then some I have been publishing or talking about our children generation will be the first one to live less than their parents' generation because of the trend in chronic disease condition, autoimmune epidemics, diabetes epidemic, obesity, and so on. And so much of this is related to nutrition that we are now doing interventions with uh, supplement and nutrition to modulate inflammation that will be synergistic with anti-aging strategies and with the uh, same chemical stem cell as we already are doing trials in diabetes that are showing. I'm not published yet, so I will not tell you the detail, but uh, we have a year follow-up that show a blocking progression of complication both neuropathy, retinopathy, and kidney disease with intervention that are similar of what you could do for prolongation of healthy lifespan in a non-diabetic subject. So it's, a, it's another fascinating area that I think you will, you will hear much more and it may require a separate uh, interview on the, on the topic because it's, a, it's becoming huge also in our field. I saw some of your papers on the uh, on carnosine and fatty acids and sort of some of these nutritional interventions. Obviously yeah, your work with inflammation, which is, uh, you know, there's this uh, term inflammaging yeah. now that is used in sort of the longevity biotech field. You mentioned senolytics, which I, I, I wasn't aware of, but I, I guess I can see now the uh, connection to cleaning out, I guess, some of the, the old or the zombie cells that aren't working anymore and getting them out of the way. And then into the 
the cell side. So you're really the, the whole continuum, which is <laughs> extremely yeah. fascinating, I guess, in this day and age of sort of systems biology you and know, so forth. You saw that zombie cell article that came out, that became viral recently. It related to diabetes, correct? It's related to anti-aging, but it's also related to diabetes because in, uh, in diabetes, we believe there is this accelerated aging that is right. inflammation based. So it's, it's a prototype inflammatory disease. If you test the uh, omega-6 over omega-3 ratio, arachidonic acid over EPA ratio in subjects with diabetes, I, I bet you a pizza could never find one with a normal range. Uh, they're all in the inflammatory range. And I'd just like to get your take on one other thing. Uh, along those lines, just thinking of sort of it, you know, areas that are unmet, but also have all these same sort of uh, dynamics, but you know, you started, as you said, in with an interest in neurology, and obviously, you're aware that you know we the, the whole industry is having a pretty bad uh, time and a success rate with anything that has to do with Alzheimer's. Um, what is your position on sort of this classification of Alzheimer's as this type three diabetes? Uh, do you see sort of some of what you're doing in terms of the inflammation, the oxidative stress? I mean, I know you're very interested in curing diabetes, but Clearly, there's a connection to a lot of this stuff back to the is, big, that really big issue is <laughs> of Alzheimer's and dementia that's coming. It was just at the Omega-3 conference in Milan a couple of months ago, and uh, mm -hmm. I was talking about the Omega-3 and diabetes, and he was talking about Omega-3 and neurodegenerative disease condition. And it clearly showed the inflammation-based uh, background that you have in Alzheimer's is similar to the one that you have in, in diabetes, and not, not only type 2 diabetes, but also autoimmune type 1 diabetes. And uh, furthermore, like we are having now pilot trials that indicate that with high dose omega-3 vitamin D, you can block the progression of autoimmunity or improve diabetes even in subjects that don't have uh, insulin production anymore because you increase insulin sensitivity, so you may need less insulin and you may have less swings in the uh, uh, values during the day. So we have now four uh, randomized prospective trials on going in Miami with high dose omega-3 and vitamin D, vitamin D3, two in pediatric subjects, two in adult subjects, uh, both at early onset up to six months from the onset of the disease or six months to 10 years and uh, uh, from the onset of, of the point diabetes. And we just had a conference uh, with uh, seven centers in Europe to start similar trials in Europe with, the co with this combination of what we call Poseidon protocol that is available online on mm -hmm. for open access. There are a lot of groups that are being interested uh, testing this, not only to treat subjects with established diabetes or newly diagnosed, but also to look for potentially for prevention when you start becoming antibody positive because the sure. earlier intervene to reverse this inflammation, we believe, the highest grade that could be the impact in a heart in progression of autoimmunity. And this is not for diabetes only. There is a, a center now, Gemelli Hospital in, uh, in Italy with uh, Professor Gasparini is looking to create a basket of autoimmune disease condition because we have preliminary anecdotal data also in psoriasis, in inflammatory bowel disease, in autoimmune hepatitis. So it seems that uh, this baseline of inflammation could be a triggering event for many autoimmune disease conditions and then modulating inflammation could be a universal strategy to prevent them or uh, intervene at the onset to try to help progression. And this is so simple, so cheap, like if you think some of the biologic costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and then vitamin D costs one dollar a month. <laughs> like that. That's why nobody wants to fund it. Like, there is no billion dollar molecule behind this uh, discovery. And, uh, and so hopefully NIH or other foundation will uh, continue to support us in testing this, uh, this potential breakthrough. Yeah, you'll get there. I have, I have no doubt. Um, but yeah, for some reason we always find these wonderful things and the things that have been off patent for, for 70 years. The fact that uh, controversy on omega-3 and vitamin D is that all this meta-analysis that show is not conclusive, but if you look in depth in this article, they never test the target range that you need to achieve. So they just give a dose. If you give one gram of omega-3 a day or 500 units or 1,000 of vitamin D, it's like a placebo effect. You don't do mm -hmm. 
don't change the inflammation uh, status of the circuit because you start activating resolomic pathways uh, only when omega-3 go above a certain level. So you start being uh, anti-inflammatory, but then you activate resolomic pathways. And then if you combine it with uh, polyphenols that activate uh, AMP kinase, like uh, Maki Berry or others, you have other benefits. And then if vitamin D start having the benefit when it goes above 40 nanogram milliliters. So you have, now you can do personalized medicine even in, uh, in this kind of moralistic approaches because it's not just enough to say, I give a pill, doesn't work. So, so if you don't affect nutrition, it's like if you say, I give slim fast to lose weight. Mm. So one slim fast a day. But then I prove it doesn't affect on, on weight loss because you're not controlling if you then eat three pizzas after the spin first. Now you can also <laughs> see what is the universe around your intervention. You cannot just say, okay, give you one pill a day because that is what Japanese people is equivalent of their consumption of fish. Right. Japanese people eat fish that would correspond to the dose, but then they don't eat uh, McDonald's or, uh, or red meat and uh, vegetable oils and all the rest of the junk that increase arachidonic acid. So uh, is the pill is not substituted of, on nutrition or the rest that you're doing it with your uh, nutrition every day. So those are the fascinating things. I think there will be such an impact potentially on our prevention of chronic degenerative disease and prevention of autoimmunity just looking at this very simple, affordable and inexpensive strategies. Fascinating. So it's fascinating. We're getting to the point where we, we typically wrap up uh, the show. Uh, we sort of move from uh, the, the science uh, and technology into what we refer to as our science fiction question. And this may be a, might take a couple of minutes with this one, but uh, we typically ask everyone on the show, obviously you've met a lot of <laughs> very important people over your career. Uh, I want to ask you about the person that you might have wanted to meet at some point. Um, it could be a scientist, an artist, uh, a celebrity, somebody from the past. Um, for you, Dr. Cordy, who would that have been? Uh, it could be Einstein, it could be Newton. You can pick anyone you want. Um, but who would that person have been for someone of your stature? And what would you have wanted to talk to that person about? Uh, obviously, this person is not someone you could have met already. <laughs> yes. Well, I was lucky to meet some of the giants of our time from uh, Leonard Bernstein in the business. Uh, my other godfather was president of the Rolling Stones for 10 years, so you can imagine the kind of the party and people that I met <laughs> growing up. But uh, in the medical field, like uh, Thomas Tarzel, if you have the opportunity to see the <clears throat> movie documentary Burden of Genius, it's a okay. fantastic uh, uh, you can see the trailer on YouTube already, but uh, you know, one thing that is uh, that reflects like how Starzl was, he was he was just going for it, taking calculated risk, and everybody was against him. Uh, I remember when I arrived in Pittsburgh in '89, the front page, uh, the cover of Times Magazine was FK506, the drug that works in Pittsburgh, because he didn't do randomized trial, and everybody was attacking him. So you can. Mm-hmm. Claim, you cannot do it. And he did it anyway. And then he did the first scenograph baboon beaver um, into human. And it, he developed the whole field of transplantation as a giant. And that documentary expressed like the pain that goes when you're uh, like uh, at this verge of the between uh, breakthrough or uh, hype and hope or people attacking you, the mudslide of the people trying to take you down while you're trying to do something innovative. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unaware of any breakthrough in medicine that came for consensus of a study session of 40 experts that all agreed that you should be funded to do that. Oh, yeah. and you, you need the validation studies and the peer review system and the big trials to validate an hypothesis done in a pilot trial. But that's where the academic uh, system uh, goes in. If you look, Carl June with the CAR T cells saving kids with leukemia, he gave mm-hmm. a talk here that was fantastic. He shows the reviewer comment from his uh, first NIH submission when he saved his first three kids and were horrendous the way he was attacked. Ah, this is just anecdotal. These are three completely different cases, not enough evidence. Uh, 
And this has been potentially one of the biggest breakthrough in cancer uh, therapy. If you see, I can send you the slide that I have on Sir Gordon, that is the Nobel Prize together with Yamanaka for sure. the RTS. So these are two unusual subjects. Yamanaka from orthopedics, then goes, he's uh, someone in a <laughs> in vitro fertilization clinic, gets the inspiration and moved to and develop IPS. Gurton leaves college, <coughs> Eton College, with the transcript from his science teacher that basically says, too stupid for science. <laughs> last in a class of 250 people would be such a waste for his parents, the teacher and himself to, to take a career in science as he would like to do. But then if you go to look in between the line, the reason for his assessment is saying, you always want to do what he wants and he never follows the indication of his mentor. <laughs> never follows the protocol and always... But these are the signs of breakthrough people. Like when you take a chance to... Do, if you grow in a field and you always listen to your mentor and your teacher and you just work through this uh, inability to look, to do lateral thinking. That they say, when I was inducted in the National Academy of Inventor last year, they asked me which one is the best invention of your 40 inventions that you contributed, which one is the number one. I said, this is none of them, but first is the ability to share them worldwide with the rest of the scientific community. And the best characteristic to me is curiosity and lateral thinking. You know, you can be in a seminar, in a research conference and see 10,000 people can see the same presentation and one thing the lateral thinking, how this can be the next breakthrough. And I make it, you mentioned Alzheimer before. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a conference hearing how <laughs> this uh, non ceruloplasmic uh, copper metabolism is linked to the progression of Alzheimer for mild cognitive impairment can predict mm -hmm. percent. And it says, why, what is the mechanism? I say, what is uh, oxidative stress protein coating defect? And you start affecting inflammation based also, but on a metal scale scale and say, then we said, wait a minute, but in diabetes you have amyloid-like deposition in the pancreas. Could it be the same mechanism? You test in diabetes and now it's coming out. You have huge difference in diabetes too. So parallel between Alzheimer's and diabetes, both omega-3, copper metabolism, and how you can affect this with uh, anti-inflammatory supplements and so on, will be uh, huge. And I think... Uh, there is definitely a parallel between diabetes and neurodegeneration. Excellent. Well, hopefully you'll, you'll solve both of them. <laughs> yes. We, we, we but, I do. Well, I, I, I really want to thank you for spending the time today. I mean, everything that you are doing and the path that you've come uh, so far is just ultimately fascinating. And the fact that, as you said, you know, you've stuck with it all this time, even <laughs> when people said no or people wrote the bad peer review um, and we just need more folks like you that uh, are willing to stay with things um, and, and see us through this clearly, well, as you mentioned, diabetes, but autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's, many unmet medical needs. Um, Dr. Ricordi, it's, it's been an ultimate pleasure. Uh, once again, for everybody listening, uh, Dr. Camilla Ricordi, Director and Chief Academic Officer of Diabetes Research at the University of Miami uh, and Director of DRI Cell Transplant Center. Uh, we will put links up to all the sites, but as, uh, as I say on your website, you will cure diabetes. This is not a prediction, it's a promise and Thank you for making that promise and making all this happen. And it's just um, an ultimate pleasure talking to you and having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope if we can inspire even a single young scientist to move on this path, it would be a great success. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much.